we read in last week's parsha how Moshe was told by Hashem that he must go return to Egypt to redeem the Jewish people and how we perform miracles and ultimately the Jews will believe that he's the Goel, he's the Redeemer and Aaron ultimately will be his spokesman and the Jews will leave Egypt. He comes to Mitzrayim, comes to Egypt, he presents his credentials, the Jews believe that he's the Redeemer. And what happens? There's a work stoppage. And word gets back to Paro about this work stoppage. He says that the reason why they have no interest in continuing and have all these ideas because they have too much time to think. It will preoccupy them with producing their quotas of bricks and if they don't produce the quotas, they will be beaten. Then you'll see they're not going to come up with all these newfangled ideas about being freed, about redemption. Because they'll only have one thing to think about, meeting the quota. So power, what does power do? Until then, the Egyptians gave a straw subsidy. They provided the straw as one of the components, ingredients to make bricks. They withdrew it and they said to the Jews, to the Jewish taskmasters, you tell your people, your constituents, that the same quotas are going to be demanded, but they have to go and they have to find their own straw. We're no longer going to provide the straw, which turned into like an impossible task. To find the straw and simultaneously meet the quotas, it's an impossibility. So the overseers of the Jews, who themselves were Jews, they went to complain to Paro. And they said to Paro, why did you withdraw the straw subsidy? He said, because you people, you're only being lackadaisical and coming up with all these claims that you should be freed and so on and so forth. It's because you're not fully occupied. You have time. So now that you have to gather your own straw, you're going to be fully consumed with meeting the quota. Therefore, I will have no longer problems. After Pyro explains it to them, they're going out from the king, Moshe and Aaron going in. Doesn't Aviram, a part of the overseers, and they say to Moshe, you've putrefied us in the eyes of the king. Before you came, things were relatively peaceful. Since you've come and present yourself as the redeemer, things have become impossible. We cannot survive it. And they said, you know, redeemer. A redeemer is supposed to bring about that it should be less difficult. Since you've come, it's become more difficult. That was thus Naviram's claim against Moshe. Moshe believed initially things were easier, but he sees they got more difficult, more complicated. What does Moshe do after he's presented with this accusation? He goes to Hashem and says, Lo me He says to God, why you bring such hardship upon the people? Why? If, if this is supposed to be redemption, why you bring such hardship upon them? Things have become more difficult rather than easier. Hashem says, it's not your concern. He says, if that's the case, you shouldn't have sent me as your agent. So Hashem says, Moshe factually spoke out of turn. What he The question was an inappropriate question, and his response was inappropriate. So Hashem says, now you will see the redemption, the Jews leaving Egypt. But bringing them into the land of Canaan, you will not bring them in. Because you failed. That's the story. Okay, now, why did Moshe? Moshe is a person who's chosen to be the redeemer. He's at that special level. 
I mean, why did he ask the question? And firstly, what's wrong with asking the question? He said, why are you making it so difficult for the people? He didn't, first, he didn't say it. Could you explain to me why things have to first become more difficult than they get easier? He used the term, why are you bringing all this harm upon them? You bring this, this, this difficulty upon them. Why? That's firstly. The tone wasn't a good tone. And the portion begins. We know that the appellation for the attribute of justice is Elohim. Yudke Vovke is Midas Arachmim, is the attribute of mercy. Vaidaber Elohim El Moshe. Elohim. Doesn't say God said to Moshe. He spoke to Moshe. Speaking is spoke is formal. Elohim is judgment. And he says, Ani Hashem. What you seek to be harsh, factually, it's Rachmin. And we're going to explain this in a moment. But the question is, why did Moshe speak out of turn? You know, Moshe himself was classified as the Ebed Hashem. He's God's servant. There's no one who's more faithful than Moshe Rabbeinu. Most humble person who walked the face of the earth. A person like this, and who is Dustin Vaviram? Dustin Vaviram was originally the two Jews who had informed on him when he killed the Egyptian, and he fled, he had to be away from Egypt for over 60 years. He lived in a spiritual wilderness because of these two people. These two people themselves were the antagonists of Moshe Rabbeinu all the years. Until finally, he was swallowed up by the ground because they were part of the mutiny of Korach. Every time there was a problem, doesn't Viram, these two Jews were behind the problem. You know, we read in Pirkei Ovos, it says, Da la bikoris. You have to know how to respond to a heretic. If people are heretics, Abikoros is versus a heretic. So we say to a Jew who is a Talmud Chochem, person has Torah knowledge, you have to be adept that when he poses his heretical position, you have to know how to respond. Why do you have to know how to respond? Because if you can't respond, you know what it's called? It's called a Chil Hashem. If you're supposed to be the expert in theology, in monotheism, in Traditional Judaism, why can't you put this place, why can't you clip this, this person's wings? Why could not you put him in his place? Therefore, we read, you have to know, you have to have the ability to respond to the heretic, to refute his position. Because if you don't refute his position, what is it? It's Chil Hashem. These two individuals, thus not Viram, they themselves were in a position they were leaders, and they were not good people. They were bad people. Whoever heard, the only advocate in the palace of the king, which is Moshe, he's the beloved grandson, adopted grandson of Paro. And after he kills the Egyptian, they inform on him, but don't you realize, we're, we're in bondage. Jewish lives are at stake every moment. And the only one who could, who could be our advocate is Moshe, and you go inform on him, to have him put to death. Where's your sense of responsibility? For your brothers? The answer is they had none. All they were interested in, their own glory, their own egos. And therefore, even if it meant having Moshe killed, he was going to be killed. Because they felt Moshe was lording over them. When he rebuked them, for when they, one was going to hit the other, he says, Russia, you, where do you have the audacity to lift your hand against your brother? They took very serious offense to this. Intolerable. Immediately they went and they informed on him. That's what happened. So what is the level of conscience of these two people? None. So these two people, what do they represent? They are the antagonists of God. And they said to Moshe, you're supposed to represent God. He's supposed to send you as a redeemer. Look what you brought us. You brought us hardship. This is not redemption. 
You know what they did to Moshe? They put their finger in his eye. He has to respond. And he, he doesn't know how to respond. Doesn't know how to respond. And he's hurt. Why is he so hurt? Because God's glory is at stake over here. This is Chil Hashem. If these two people speak that way and he can't respond, this is Chil Hashem. So he comes to Moshe. And he says, Loma Rose, but he comes to God and he says, Why you bring such hardship upon the Jewish people? Loma Hariosa, why you bring such terrible things upon them? But why he was it was only reaction because he had such love for God, such reverence for God, anything which put that in jeopardy, he reacted to it. And that reaction caused that he wasn't sufficiently careful to speak as he should have spoken, with a greater level of sensitivity and humility, and therefore, he failed. And therefore, God says, because he spoke out of turn, now you will see the redemption, the future, you will not see them entry, the entry into the land. But that was the basis. I asked the question, after Jews left Egypt, does not Viram left Egypt with the Jewish people? And they were at Sinai. And again, they were involved in every problem, they were behind the problem, usurping Moshe Rabbeinu's authority. So I asked the question Moshe Rabbeinu, once he became the leader of Jewish people, he took the Jews out of Egypt. He was no longer the redeemer. He was he assumed the position of king. He was the king of the Jewish people. The law is a person who's legally king. He has a right to take a person's life, to decide a person has should be put to death. Because anything you usurp the authority of the king, you should be put to death. Moshe Rabbeinu, these people are worse than troublemakers. They were undermining his authority, undermining the word of Hashem. He should have taken them out. He should have put them to death. Why didn't he put him to death? That's the question. When Moshe was in Midian, he was away for over 60 years. He's shepherding the sheep of his father-in-law. And God comes and says, it's time to return. Because the people who informed on you, they're no longer alive. And the term the Torah uses, ki mesu anoshim. Those people died. They died. So the Gemara asks a question. The people who informed them with Dasan Aviram. They're still alive. So what did God say to them? They're no longer alive. So the Talmud says that the, originally when they informed the Moshe, they were, there was a wealthy class among Jews within the slave class. Slave class. And because they were wealthy... That certain relationship in the upper echelons of the, of the Egyptian government. Therefore, they were able to inform a Moshe Rabbeinu. Since then, they became impoverished. And because they became impoverished, therefore, they no longer had those relationships. So therefore, he was saying to him, and from here, we take the takeaway is, only Choshev Kemes, a person who's impoverished, he's like, he's like a dead person. Nobody pays attention to you any longer. For all intents and purposes, like non-existent. When a person is impoverished. Therefore, you could go back. You don't have to worry. So I asked an obvious question. Why does Hashem have them lose their wealth? And that's why they're referred to as they're no longer alive. God should have taken them out. Why did God take them out? He should have taken their lives. Why do we have to play games? Make them impoverished. And impoverished is like a dead person because nobody pays attention to you. They deserve to be taken out, to be killed. They inform the Moshe. For that alone, they deserve to be killed. They're informers. And again, over and over, what did Hashem take them out? That's an obvious question. And when Moshe became king, he did not take them. When they usurped his authority, he did not put them to death, which he had a right, legally. Why did he put him to death? Because he saw when God appeared to him in the desert and told him to go back, God says they've had financial reversals, therefore they're poor. That's the meaning they died. 
Then they're totally ineffective. But Moshe had a question. Why didn't God take them out? God didn't take their lives. So if God could have taken their lives and didn't take his life, their lives, evidently Moshe understands that although legally he could take their lives, he's not going to take their lives. And he's going to tolerate them. As God tolerated them, Moshe will tolerate them also. Now the question is, well, why? Why tolerate them? So we discussed this in the past. There's a verse in Kohelis, Elokini Vakish Nirdov. God seeks out the pursuit. Seeks. God favors the pursuit. Elokini Vakish Nirdov. What are examples from the beginning of history that God favors the pursuit? We find the story Cain and Hevel, Cain and Abel, two brothers, the first brothers born into existence. And Cain goes and kills Abel. Cain kills Hevel. Why? There was an envy. Why was there an envy? Because it's, the Torah tells us they both brought, both brought sacrifices to God. Cain brought from the dregs of the earth a flax plant and Hevel, being a farmer, being a shepherd, he brought from the choices of his sheep as a sacrifice. Torah tells us that Hashem turned towards the sacrifice of Hevel and did not acknowledge the sacrifice of Cain. Cain. You know something? If you're totally egotistic, that's something you can't live down. It's too much to swallow. And that just enraged him and he picked a fight and he killed his brother. That's the story of Cain and Abel. But why did God favor the sacrifice of Abel, Hevel over Cain? It seems to me, if you read it literally, he brought a quality sacrifice, Hevel did not. So the Medjish tells us before this incident happened, Cain pursued Abel to take his life continuously. He hounded him. And he was a Nirdov. And because Elakimi Vakish Nirdov, because God favors the underdog, the pursuit, that's why he favored the sacrifice of Hevel over the sacrifice of Cain. For that reason, because he is the pursuit. What's the next example of God favors the pursuit? The story of Noah and the members of the generation. He built an ark, 120-year project. For what? To forewarn them of the great flood, flood coming. They should do tshuva. They should repent. They did not leave him, let, let him live. They hounded him. They threatened him. If we see you going to the ark, we'll destroy the ark. We'll kill you. We'll kill your family. It says, Noach motzachem b'nei Hashem. Why did Noah survive the great flood and he was admitted into the ark? Noah found favor in the eyes of God. Why? Because he was pursued. So because he was pursued by the members of the generation, that's why he was the lone survivor with his family. Uh, Yitzchak, the son of Avram, was pursued by Yishmael. Ishmael, the son of Hogar, and Yitzchak was the son of Rivka, because he was pursued, Hashem favored him. And it goes, and why was Yaakov favored over Esau? Of course, Yaakov was pursued by Esau. And why the Jewish people favored over the nations of the world? Because we're pursued by the nations of the world. So because we're near Dauphin, we're pursued, therefore God favors us. Okay? Now, the Medjish concludes, well, how did Moshe become the favorite of God? Do you know why? How he became the favorite of God? Because he was pursued by Pharaoh. When he killed the Egyptian, and Dosan Aviram informed on him, he had to flee. So who caused the flight? Did he have to abandon everything and flee for his life? Dosan Aviram. I mean, the pursuer was Paro. But who created the setting for him to flee? It was Dustin Aviram. Now, 
At the time of the golden calf, God says, I will destroy the Jewish people. Moshe supplicated God they shouldn't be destroyed. Why was Moshe's tefillah, his supplication, accepted? And they were not destroyed. Do you know why? Because since Moshe was a near dove, was pursued by power all those years, he became a favorite of God. And because he became a favorite of God, therefore his tefillah was accepted, and that's why there's a Jewish people. So now, we ask the question, why did God take out Dustin Leviram? Should have taken them out. They're bad people. They informed the Moshe. These people have no conscience. They have no sense of loyalty even to their own brothers. Do you know why? Because even though they did something very evil, but what were, what were the fruits that that evil act bore? What fruits did, they bear, did it bear? Then Moshe Rabbeinu became so special because he was pursued that he had to go into exile all those years. Therefore, he's seen by God as one of a kind. And therefore, his tefillah was able to stay the execution and there's a Jewish people. So what does God owe Dustin Aviram? He owes it to them. He's beholding to them. Only because of them was Moshe able to develop to be that special person. And therefore, there's a Jewish people. That's why God did not take out Dustin and Viram, to kill them. Because he had a debt of gratitude to them. As bad as they were, their action brought about something which is has eternal value, which is the Jewish people. So Moshe Rabbeinu understood. Just as Hashem did not take them out, although they deserved to be taken out, because of ultimately what their action brought about, Moshe Rabbeinu, although he's king, and the king has a right if you defy his order to execute these people, take their lives, he did not. Because he was beholden to them was that circumstance which they created was due to them and he became Moshe who had that language and had the clout with God that he could stay the execution. Nobody else was able to stay that execution. But these people they say to Moshe, look what you've done to us. Rather than things getting better, they've gotten worse. So that claim to Moshe was, this is a desecration. Where's God? And Moshe Rabbeinu doesn't know what to respond. Doesn't know what to say. And he's pained. Because people like Dostum Aviram are espousing Shil Hashem. That's what they're doing. Immediately runs to Hashem. Why did you bring such hardship on the people? Now, the Gemara tells us, we find that Rivka was barren. They were married 20 years and Torah attested the fact she was barren. She couldn't conceive a child. So the Torah tells us, Vayeta Yitzchak he prayed opposite his wife. And Hashem answered his prayer, his philo, supplication. Usually, the term for prayer is by his palil. He prayed. What's by yetar? Well, it's an expression of prayer, but it's not the conventional expression of prayer, of philo. What's by yetar? So the Gemara tells us. In Hebrew, a pitchfork is called an atar. What does a pitchfork do? The farmer, he takes it, and he puts it under the straw, the hay, and he turns it over. It's something, a utensil, a tool that you turn things upside down over. Yetar is an expression of tefillah, a prayer, which is so powerful, it's able to take midas arzorius, the attribute of cruelty and turn into an attribute of kindness. Those are the words of, of the Gemara. So I ask the question, there's no such thing as God forbid as an attribute of cruelty. There's Mid Sadin, there's the attribute of justice, but it's not cruelty. Chas There's nothing, there's no negative, nothing negative about God himself. We say at Surah Tom and Polo, whatever he does is perfect. 
There's no iniquity in his justice. So how can you say cruelty? So the way we explained it in the past was Midas Adin, the attribute of justice. What's its perception? How do people perceive it? People with that limited understanding. It seems to me it's, it's too much. Did we deserve a Holocaust? Six million Jews, a million children should die in a Holocaust. Were we that bad? What we deserve, deserve that a third of our population should be annihilated with these atrocities? That we are we were that bad? So the way it's perceived, God, God forbid, went beyond the pale to punish the Jewish people. So it, the way it's perceived, it's an act of cruelty, God forbid. But it's not cruelty. It's Midas Adin. It's the attribute of justice. But if you don't understand the nature of what has to be done, you see it as being too extreme. Therefore, as a result of that, it's referred to as the attribute of cruelty because that's the way it's processed. That's the, way, that's the lens people see it. But in essence, it's Midas Adin. It's the attribute of justice. Except people, they don't know how to add it up and see why it should be the way. Therefore, they say it's beyond the pale. It's too much. So therefore, it's referred to as the Midas Arzorius. Although there's no such attribute of cruelty, it's the attribute of justice, but that's processed as if it's too, as if it is cruelty. When Dasla Viram said to Moshe Rabbeinu, you've putrefied us in the eyes of Paro and his servants. That means, Moshe, you're God's spokesman. God putrefied us. Could you imagine such language? Moshe has to counter it. He has to re respond. These people had the audacity even to say it the way they said it. Moshe Rabbeinu has a reaction. Goes to Hashem, he says, Loma Rosa, Loma Zel, Loma Zashat Tari. Why did you bring such hardship? Such difficulty on the Jewish people? Why did you send me? So that was only a reaction to the, what? To the criticism and the claim of does not veer against God. So it comes out interesting. Moshe fled because of does not veer for 60 years. He was a fugitive. Now, when he first is, is back, a short stay, he forfeits his right to go into the promised land because of who? Does not be wrong. Now, we read in the Torah, Moshe did not go into the land. In addition, because he struck the rock rather than speaking to the rock. So it's difficult. Is it because of A or is it because of B? Or is it a combination of both? That's why he didn't go into the land. So we ask the question, if God truly wanted Moshe to go into the land, he shouldn't have pre presented these challenges to him. And as a result of that, he wouldn't have chosen to do the wrong thing. So evidently, Hashem did not want Moshe to go into the land. Didn't want him to go. Because if he has no claim against him, he has to let him go into the land. But it was essential and crucial that he should not go into the land. Why was it essential and crucial he should not go into the land? So we explained that there's a midrash that says that we know in the 40th year of the desert, we sinned with the Balpa'or, with the daughters, the Midianite women, the Moite women. We sinned. The Jews deserve to be annihilated. If not for Pinchas' act of zealotry, where he killed the prince of the tribe of Shimon with Kozvi Basur, the, the Midianite princess, we would have been annihilated. That was the attribute of justice being so intense. Who saved the day Pinchas? But factually, that idolatry called Baal Peor, where people would defecate on the idol, that is such an intense level of prosecution. When that prosecution rears its head to prosecute Jewish people, the only thing that could counter it is Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu had to be buried outside of Canaan, opposite the location which they sinned with this idol, which is called Bapor. And when it attempts to prosecute, when it sees the grave of Moshe Rabbeinu, 
that quelches the prosecution, cannot stand up and prosecute. And therefore, there's only Jewish people because Moshe is buried there. Because we could not survive that prosecution. So why did Moshe hit the rock? Why did Moshe speak out of turn? It's true, it does not be wrong. But God could have prevented the or, or this scenario didn't have to unfold. He could have had it sidestepped. The answer, since ultimately Moshe had to be buried opposite Balpaor, therefore we have to have reasons, legitimate reasons why he, he doesn't merit to go into the land. Firstly, he spoke out of turn. But God could have had him evade that setting and he wouldn't have spoken out of turn. God didn't have to share with him about say to him, speak to the rock. Or the Jews could obey themselves. This was God didn't want him to go in. But why didn't God go in? Because God wanted that he should be the counterforce against the prosecution that there should be a Jewish people. So God orchestrates all these situations. I'll tell you the truth. Right now we're dealing with what's going on in Eretz Yisrael. The unlimited casualties. Young Jewish boys, single, married, parents, families, and the women are left widows, the children are left orphans. It's painful beyond. What's it all about? What's it all about? You know, right now we live, it's called Ikhbis and Mashiach. We're living in the Messianic times, right before the coming of Mashiach. And just as it says over here, the way the Archaim learns explains this Pasuk, Hashem says, that that you see, Midas Adin, in truth, that's Midas Arachim. And initially, how many years were we supposed to be in Egypt? 400 years. We were there only 210 years. Why was the bondage intensified? So some of the commentaries explain, because if we were supposed to be there 400 years, we wouldn't have survived in 400 years. We would have so gone into the spiritual oblivion. So God condensed it, intensified the bondage that the less was the equivalent of the more. Instead of being the 400 years, through the intensification of the bondage, we were there only 210 years. So 190 years, we were saved at that level of exposure. That's what happened. So it comes out, the Midas Hadin, the attribute of justice, which is the intensification, really is mercy. Because you wouldn't have survived it otherwise. I used to give the example, we gave recently, you know, when we were younger and you were in high school, you were able to go to summer school. At summer school, you were able to take classes for six weeks and you were able to save a year of high school. Six weeks. But during those six weeks, every day you had another exam and you had to study material which you would study over a year. You really had to apply yourself. It's too much. They're working us. The workload is too much. No, but you realize the workload we're giving in six weeks is the equivalent of workload of a year. And if you are able to deal with it and handle it, you save yourself a year, a year of school. So is it too much? It's not too much. If you want to save the year, you got to work hard for six weeks. If you don't want to be there 400 years and you only do 210 years, of course, you couldn't survive the 400 years. What does Hashem do? He intensifies the bondage only so you should only have to be there less time. Not to be there 400 years. So the last straw that was painful was withdrawal of the straw subsidy. Because this is in your best, faith, best, best interest. This is the attribute of mercy. To be able to survive, to leave. Otherwise, you couldn't have left. Because we would have gone into spiritual oblivion otherwise. That's the understanding. Al-Kim, which is the attribute of justice, says, Ani Hashem. What you see as the attribute of justice, that's mercy. That that I'm intensifying the bondage, that's the ultimate mercy. 
so she'd be able to leave and survive as a Jewish people. Now, as I mentioned, we're we're holding Ikvus and we're in the birth, we're in the throes of messianic times. Mashiach is not too far off. We have debt to pay. We have atonement. Every Jewish person, young man, every person who's killed, the Talmud tells us saving one life, Jewish life, is the equivalent of saving the world. You have 8 billion people in this world. One Jewish life has greater value in God's eyes to a billion people than 8 billion people. So every Jew that dies in this war is killed. In God's eyes, what happened? What level of tragedy happened? It's something which is not fathomable. We can't even fathom the value of a Jew. Only God knows the innate value of a Jew. And now we have all these casualties. We have all these suffering. The widows, the children, orphans, everything. You know what this is? This is kapora. This is atonement. Only because, but only God knows. You mean you could have done it differently? Evidently not. This is the only path to take. It's an, a necessary path. It's like a person, God forbid, has a tumor. And the doctor says, the only way you can survive, radiation is not going to help you, medication is not going to help you. You have to have radical surgery. Nothing else is going to work. But when you do that radical surgery and you cut out that tumor and the person is now able to live healthy, that removal of the tumor is what? That's the only way to go is an act of mercy. As painful as it is, the only route to go to bring Mashiach, we need sacrifices. Why were these people chosen? Not others. Only God knows. We don't have all the answers. But the approach the perspective is this is the perspective and look what it's generating the level of chesed that jews worldwide are doing in unity to provide for those families to provide for the jewish people in israel it couldn't have happened any other way we needed this the atrocity of october 7th that there should be a war and these communities should be destroyed and they were forced to evacuate and they needed food because their livelihoods were affected. Their residences were affected. Somebody has to come to the plate and bring in those mega dollars to provide the basic amenities of life. So world Jewry, why did they have an opportunity to unify, to do chesed? Because of the atrocities that took place. But only God knows. So God allows certain things to happen because there has to be results. Results are you need sacrifices. Sacrifices, Jewish lives are sacrificed. Those are the equivalent of bringing an offering. That's atonement. Unification is crucial. Jews have to be unified. In Israel, all the Jews became unified. Secular, not. We're all in this together. We're here to help one another. Charity-wise, world Jewry, sending Exceptional sums of money to Israel to make their their plight a lot easier, a lot lighter. Just want to end with one, one thing. Hashem says to Moshe, I'm upholding the covenant. with the patriarchs to give them the land of Canaan I'm upholding the covenant now Eretz Yisrael is known as the holy land why is it known as the holy land no location in the world is referred to as the holy land you know the Arabs consider Mecca that's their only a Muslims permitted to go to Mecca because they're holy. Whatever you want to say that is. L'havdil, Elif Havdolis. But the holy land is Eretz Yisro. Why is, why is the land of Israel called Eretz HaKadosha, the holy land? So the way it's explained, that the world was divided among the 70 root nations of the world. Every root nation has an archangel overseeing its needs. The Jewish people have no archangel. We have a direct relation with God. 
And because the land of Canaan, which is Israel, is God's location, whatever God's associated with is considered holy. When God's presence descended on, Mount, on Har Sinai, the mountain became holy. When Moshe Rabbeinu was in the desert and he saw the burning bush and the angel says, take off your shoes because it's hallowed land, earth, because the divine presence was there. Wherever the divine presence is, that's holy. Eretz Yisrael has no archangel. We have no archangel. We have a direct relation, relation with Hashem. That's what Eretz Yisrael is. Now, the land is holy. Could you imagine you have a vault? The vault has a door which is about 40 feet thick. And it has a combination on it. And in that vault, you have the crown jewels. And you have amounts of money which are mega money. But you don't have the combination to that vault. Although the vault contains something which is unequaled in, in value, but if you don't have access to it, what's it worth? But if you have that combination and you know exactly how to open that safe, that vault, what's in it becomes available to you. The land of Israel is the holy land. Now, how do you experience it? How do you how do you access it? So there's a beautiful balaturim here. It says, it says, I have a covenant with them. Losis lohemis eretz Canaan. The word in Hebrew, losis, to give them the land of Canaan. So the balaturim explains the numerical value of losis is. 830. What is 830? The first temple stood 410 years. The second temple stood 420 years. So what's the losses? He gave us the land of Canaan, which is the holy land. But I said, how do you access whatever it represents? Losses. He gave us two temples. The first temple, which we served God, stood 410 years. The second temple stored 420 years. That's the losses. He gave us the land of Canaan. He gave us an entry point. He gave us the ability to enter, to be recipients and beneficiaries of whatever that holiness is by giving us the base of Megdosh, the first and second temple. Because the numerical value of losses to give is 830. And that's what it's about. So what relevance do the nations of the world have to the land of Israel? Nothing. And maybe a holy land, but they have no relevance to it. You have no access to that safe, to that vault. We have the access. And you know, it goes by fingerprint recognition, by facial recognition. When the Jew goes there, facial recognition, he connects. Fingerprint, finger recognition, he connects. The non-Jew, the Gentile face, doesn't activate the systems. He's on the outside. Although you're in the land, but you can't access whatever that land, whatever that holiness represents. You don't have the capacity. Only the Jewish people were given that. They have the code words and they have the capacity to connect to whatever that NG is. The non-Jew doesn't have that, that ability. Okay. I think we're going to stop here and I just...